not too many of you are going to catch your last train after the show another break. Um, <laughs> unless someone wants to correct me, um, if you've got the notes, the Nottingham notes about this, um, I think they're slightly awry in that, well, for one thing, the name of the photographer is actually, I think, the composer of the music for the German version. Uh, but more importantly, the, it suggests that the, the note suggests that the film was made in Germany. I, I think the film was 100% shot in this country. Um, but I'm willing to be corrected. Um, it was originally a silent release in this country in December 1928. Then sound was added for another release in July 1929. It was a co-production with Germany, with FPS Studios. Um, but, and so there was a German version. But to quote a press cutting from the time, a remarkably successful joint product of England and America was shown at the Astoria yesterday in the sound film of The Wrecker. This film, based on Arnold Ridley's play, which I'll come to in a minute, um, was, has been directed by Mr. G. M. Bolvery at the Gainsborough Studios and on English railway lines with the cooperation of the Southern Railway and synchronised with music and sound effects at the Radio Corporation Studios in New York. So this NFTVA copy of the film that you're about to see is actually from the American sound version of the film. They produced their own soundtrack specifically for America by the looks of it. Um, unfortunately, there is no copy of that soundtrack. So <laughs> what you're going to see is it's no great loss, I don't think. Um, there was a theme song called Are You Really Mine? And how on earth that fitted into the film, heaven knows. Um, the song was written by Irving Caesar, quote, sometimes I write lousy but always fast. And so I think that's probably no great loss. But it does mean um, the print is missing two brief sections of dialogue which are added late in the day. And so what you're going to see early on in the film is a brief shot of a newsreader talking to a microphone with not a word of sound over it. Um, more importantly, near the end of the film, there's a sequence where they're trying to trap the wrecker by using a sound recording. Mm -hmm. And again, there's no sound. So you have to make up your own dialogue, I'm afraid. If anyone can lip read it, please see me afterwards. <laughs> uh, but I, I think you'll kind of muddle through. I think it, it all makes sense anyway without the sound. Um, just a word about the crashes in the film, which are probably the most exciting thing. Um, or rather, the crash, because it's actually one crash filmed cunningly from several angles and then used to represent several different crashes. Um, it was filmed, um, well, a press blurb says there were 21 cameras to cover the crash. And if so, I think probably 17 of them must have jammed because there's only a, there's only a sign of kind of four or five angles um, which they use to represent the different crashes. Um, supposedly, there was even one on the front of the locomotive, and again, there's no sign of, of that shot. Um, it was the first time they said that a British railway company had cooperated with a film company like this in doing a train smash. Um, and they did it by running a complete express train with six bogey coaches. And sadly, they were the earliest bogey coaches ever built in this country, which they destroyed in the crash, um, in, into a Foden steam lorry on a level crossing. The crash is very well documented. It happened on August the 19th, 1928, on the Basingstoke and Alton branch line. And there's a quote, the engine was an absolute wreck and the whole of the train was off the track with the exception of the last pair of wheels. The steam wagon was literally smashed to smithereens on the crossing and the train had dashed on for a further 100 yards by toppling over on its side. A 30 foot rail had pierced the tender and the guard's van. Um, what they did was to remove two 30 foot sections of rails to, to derail the train to cause the crash. And you might also like to know that <laughs> at 6.55 p.m. that night, only a breakdown gang remained to clear up the wreckage. This was completed by 10 a.m. on the following day, and normal working was resumed on the line less than six hours later. Obviously, that kind of time has improved a lot since 1928. <laughs> um, uh, the, crash, the crash itself, the footage, was reused in a later Gainsborough film, in Gainsborough, um, called Seven Sinners in 1937. And again, it's exactly the same footage from the film. It isn't the other shots from other angles from any of these other 21 cameras. Um, and the plot was sort of recycled without the crashes, but with some better jokes added uh, in the Tiffield Thunderbolt. And 
Again, those films were all produced by Michael Balkan, so he was recycling material from the wrecker. Um, and the same Basingstoke Alton line, railway line, was used again for Gainsborough's Will Hay film, Oh Mr. Porter. Um, the line actually had quite a chequered history. They ripped the tracks up once um, because they thought they needed the metal for the worst, First World War and then didn't use any of it. And then when they made Oh Mr. Porter, they were ripping the tracks up all over again, permanently. <laughs> and they said that when they were shooting Oh Mr. Porter, there were times when they'd go to do a retake and the track had already been ripped up behind them. So there was one scene where they're trying to um, throw a, a train through a level crossing. They went to do a retake and couldn't shunt the train back far enough because there was no line behind them but <laughs> to do it. Um, it's fitting that last year's successful showing here of, of Gainsborough's The Ghost Train, The Silent Ghost Train, should be followed this year by The Wrecker because the stage play The Wrecker was written in 1927, two years after and as a sequel to the stage play The Ghost Train, both by Arnold Ridley, late of Dad's Army fame. Mm. <laughs> uh, in fact, the, the whole reason that he, that Arnold Ridley appeared in Dad's Army is that um, he ran out of money. He, he'd sold all the rights to the ghost train long ago, so he needed to work for television. Um, the, the play The Ghost Train ran for 655 performances at London's St. Martin's Theatre, and the record wasn't quite as successful at the sequel. It ran for 165 at London's New Theatre. Um, and again, Gainsborough bought the rights, film rights, though this time Angus MacPhail changed the plot quite considerably. Um, the original play was very much a mystery, with the, the wrecker unmasked right at the end of the play and everything leading up to that. And um, in the final scene, the, the, I won't tell you who the wrecker is in the play, just in case you see it, but um, <clears throat> he's someone involved with the railway who goes completely mad, starts shouting, kill the trains, kill the trains runs out over the railway line and is killed by a train. Um, that doesn't happen in the film. Um, in the film, the wrecker is, is exposed very early on, and if you've got the notes for the showing, um, you would have known three days ago who the wrecker was. <laughs> so, but, but that is not a mystery, so it doesn't matter. Um, fr from the play, uh, the, the locations are obviously greatly ex expanded with all these crashes. Um, if we could have the stills, please. The play consisted of three acts. Uh, we have still, please. Thanks. And I've got stills from two of the, the sets uh, for a reason that will become clear in a moment. Um, this is the general office of the Grand Trunk Railway in the play. The, the crashes in the play are only seen on that indicator board in the middle of the set at the back and what happens is the, the paths of the trains are indicated by green lights which then go red if there's a crash on the line. Uh, so that was the main set for the play. The other main set, which should appear in a moment, is the signal box. That's it. The signal box interior at Pagham Moor Junction. And if you can just note please, there are I think 11 um, points leaders in the background and also there's a stove on the right-hand side of the set. Make a note of that. <laughs> no, there's, there's a reason. <laughs> uh, because, to give a flavour of the play, and because it's so different to the film, what I thought might be fun, but might not be, would be to reenact a part of um, Act 2, Scene 2, the scene in the Pack and Moor signal box, for which we have assembled five cast of superb acting talent gathered from the four corners of the building. Um, with, unfortunately, the lavish scenery I was promised um, and the props have failed to arrive. Um, and we also don't have any costumes, um, no sound effects, and we've had no rehearsal. Otherwise, I think the performance will be impeccable. Uh, so if I can just introduce the, the cast as they're going to appear. Um, as I said, the original play was a mystery. And what I hope you'll see is that um, very much in the ghost train tradition, um, with a bit of Phantom of the Opera thrown in. And that's what's in this scene, and that's what's not in the film. Um, and there are various red herrings along the way um, in the mystery until the, the, the wrecker is finally unmasked. Um, as you'll see, even the police inspector is suspected at one point in this scene. So imagine, if you will, 
that this is Packham Moor signal box, a wild and lonely place. Um, it, the script says the wind whistles and it rains throughout. It's nearly midnight and signalman Horace Skeet, beautifully played by David Williams. <laughs> <laughs> has been left for the night by his fellow signalman, Alfred, um, and is becoming increasingly spooked because there have already been several wrecks on the railway line. Um, Inspector Ratchet, played by Michael Eaton, yeah. and his able assistant, Haynes, played by Tony Fletcher, yeah. have just arrived at the signal box, and Roger Doyle, he's known as Lucky Doyle, in the script, a good-looking young fellow and vigorous football type is, of course, <laughs> is naturally played by Neil Brown. <laughs> and Mary, his shy retiring girlfriend, is, of course, Jenny Hamilton. <laughs> um, they're, they're dashing to the rescue, so they'll appear later in the scene. They're dashing to the rescue because these people have been tipped off by a note from the mysterious wrecker, which was stuck on a door by a dagger in the previous scene. The wrecker is now threatening the Rainbow Express, which is, uh, well, anyway, the Rainbow Express. And the note reads, the note read, attached to the dagger from the wrecker, the Rainbow Express, Pagamore Junction, 11.55 tonight. So now we'll read on. This will be a bit more of a, a reading than I think it'll be a reenactment. But... Oh, sorry one prop we've got a gun. Okay, here we go. Hang on. Okay. Action. Curtain, I mean. Are you going to be here all night? Shout if you can't hear, by the way. I'm sorry we've got no microphone. Are you going to be here all night? I don't know. It all depends. What's for the breeze up you? Anything happen? No. Do you think anything might happen? I hope so. I hope so. Of course. What do you think we're here for? To look after me, he said. So we are, in a way. What do you mean, in a way? He means that our job is to get Couldn't you get him somewhere else? I mean, <laughs> just as you like. We might sit outside in the rain, and then if he pops in, you could ask him to pop down and sit. <laughs> but what sort of bloke do you think he is? How do we know? <laughs> if you don't know what kind of bloke he is, how are you going to know who he is when you find him? <laughs> you have to say something else. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. Let, they say he's a smart sort of man. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a head on him, all right. And he's got pluck. It wants nerve to calmly say he's going to wreck the Rainbow Express tonight and to give time and place as well. What time's he going to do it? 11.55, he says. Why, that's just the time the Express comes by. Exactly! <laughs> that's why we are here. You mean this is the place? Not if we can help it. <laughs> Here, I say, what are you doing? Here, I say, what are you doing? Don't be a fool. This is a trap. Yeah, it looks like an island bit of cheese. Nothing <laughs> will happen to you. So don't get the wind up about it. It isn't your fault. No, it's the fault of all them newspapers. Three thousand quid, the Tribune will pay to anybody whose wife is killed in a smash. Think of that. Three thousand quid. Why, you're a damn sight better off when you do it. Three thousand quid for losing your trouble and strife. I wouldn't have my wife killed for three hundred thousand. How long you been married then? <laughs> well, well, as a matter of fact, I'm not married at all. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Hello! She's due in fifteen minutes. Well, I think I'll have a look along the line. I'll come along with you. No! You stay here. Have you got a gun? I came out in such a hurry I didn't get one. It comes to the store. Better have mine. Never mind. 
I'll take this one. Here? I say, no you don't. That's my revolver. Haynes? <laughs> Haynes? Yeah? Give him a receipt for it. I don't want no receipt for it. I mean, what if the guy comes in and all I've got to offer him is my receipt? <laughs> That's no good. That'd be no good at all. Give me my revolver. Huh? You've got a license for this, I suppose. Well, you see, um, well, you know, I, you know how it is. No, no. Haynes, <laughs> job for you. No license for his revolver. In the meantime, I'll look after it for you. Yeah, I say, go easy. I'll be back soon, Haynes. Lummy, he's a one. He's a regular sergeant major. I tell you, it ain't right to take my revolver. I'll put my union onto it. I'm sure that's what I'd do. Oh, dry up! <laughs> Haynes strolls up to the signal levers and fiddles with one or two of them at the left. Hey, don't touch them. You know better than that. What does it do? Leave it be, I say. Do you want to wreck the train? Would it? You damn fool, if you pull that lever, it'll send the co it'll send the express right onto the coal line and then right into the embankment. Law! Oh. Leave it be, I tell you. Leave it be. Law, you're jumpy, ain't ya? Yeah, I guess I may be. I I've fair got the orders tonight. If you go get the orders, you'll be losing your job. And that wouldn't worry me much. Uh, if I lost it quick enough. <laughs> See here. Who is that? He told you, Inspector Ratchet, Chief of the Railway Police. How long have you known? I never met him till tonight. He picked me up at the junction. Well, I don't like it. I've got a common instinct that he's, he ain't up to no good. Rubbish! Haynes takes a piece of paper from his pocket and twists it into a spill and stoops over the fire to light his pipe. Again, he lights it from the fire. A faint smoke issues from the stove. Haynes coughs, <laughs> sits on the stool by the stove, and suddenly looks up. What's that? What's that? What? Listen, listen. I don't hear anything. There's somebody on the roof. Listen. What? There is, I'll tell you. It's only the rain. I could have sworn to it. Look here. You're not going to put the wind up me. Phew. Look, this is a stuffy hole. Anything here to drink? Only hot water. Give me some, will you? I've come over all queer. Skeet gets a glass of water and brings it to him. Haynes, quite groggy, drinks it. <laughs> What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you, eh? I don't know. I feel, I feel a bit off. <laughs> no wonder you're feeling queer. I'm feeling a bit rotten myself this last half hour. And then that blooming Sergeant Major man come and took my revolver just to about put the tin hat on it. The smoke still comes from the stove and Haynes' head begins to nod. You haven't got no right to take it. He won't is. How long do you think it'll be before he's back? Hey? Eh? Yeah. How long do you think it'll be before he's back? Here, yeah, what's up with you? What's up with you? You can't go to sleep, you know. Who, who, who don't sleep? You are! Wake up! Wake up! Duty! Never! Sleep! Here, yeah, mate, aren't you Duty. well? Duty! Aren't you well, mate? <laughs> Have another drink. <laughs> another drink. Hey, here! Drink this! Go on, drink it! God's sake, what's up here? <laughs> Oh, mate, wake up. My God, he's dead. Oh, <laughs> my God. Here, mate, I say. Oh, I've got it. They've gassed him. That's what they've done. They've gassed him. God, mate, what'll happen next? He quickly puts the lid on the stove and puts a handkerchief to his mouth and backs away. <coughs> backs away. Hey, Bill! Bill! And dashes to the phone. <laughs> Be right Bill, the Bill, they gassed him, they gassed him. Yeah, who's that then? Who's there? Who, who, who is this? Bill, I say, Gordon, get off the line. Hey, oh my God, 
Here, mate. Here, here. And the rainbow's coming through in a minute. Wake up, wake up. Don't you wake up. Oh. Help! 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 Noiselessly, the door opens and a becloaked black figure enters bearing a scarf. Skeet, who is leaning out of the window, does not see him. The stranger seizes Skeet from behind, hits him on the head, and throws the scarf round his neck. A struggle, the stranger covering Skeet's mouth with a cloth in the scarf. Let go! Let go! They let go! I tell you! Let go! They, oh, let go. <laughs> <laughs> they struggle. The stranger forces Skeet back over the table with a pad on his mouth. Skeet's struggles grow less and less. He collapses with the scarf tied round his face. He falls. Oh, you've done that. Um, the, st the stranger ties the scarf over his mouth. The stranger then examines Haynes and then. Wrong one. That's a bell ringing. Um, what's happening now is that the wrecker character that, um, is sending signals down the line to, to wreck the express. So there's assorted bells. Um, it then says um, Haynes has already been. He pulls several of the levers, the point levers, which Haynes has already been touching in the previous scene. He throws the diagram, that's the diagram of um, the, uh, where the levers should be, out of the window. He gives a final glance at Haynes on the floor and starts to the door. There are footsteps on the stairs. He switches the lights off and hides behind overcoats hung on the wall below the door. The door is thrown open and Roger and Mary enter. Lord, what a ride! It was worth it if we're on time. Hello, I say, anybody here? Who put out the light? It was on until a second ago. That's odd. Taking a torch from his pocket and flashing it about the room, he sees Haynes lying on the floor. <laughs> ah, who's this? Good God. Can't you find the switch? Here it is. Oh, see here. What? The signalman. There's something doing right here and now. <laughs> is he? Dead? No, chloroform. Pretty stiff dose too, by the way, he's breathing. Keep his head down, give him some water. Oh, what about this chap? Who can he be? Suppose he's the wrecker. Well, if it is, he's pretty well out of action. He's done for. Probably someone's been tampering with the signals. Undoubtedly, but I can't tell you what they've done. There's no chart. You see, you've got to get this phone round. Look! It's ten to twelve! The rainbow will be here! I know, I know. Stop her before she gets into the section. Hello? 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 That's the wireless. Oh, what can we do? Suppose he's already put a train through. <laughs> By God, he has! The rainbow is into the section. What can we do? Five minutes. We simply must get this fellow round. Yes, yes. <laughs>
angels, women and children. Here, you signal a witch, leave a witch, you fool. Listen, she's coming! By God, you're right. <laughs> That's no good. They'll never see it around the bend. They couldn't stop it in time. Help! Help! You must take a chance on these, then. He sent one of these. Yes, but which one? To the right or the left? Isn't there any way to tell? No! Oh, my God! Roger! I got it! Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Without more ado, here's the <laughs> 